Welcome to Postcards to the Universe with Melissa Caprio. Do you believe in magic? What if you were told that all you had to do was get a little creative and work a magic spell to bring anything you can imagine into your life? Here on Postcards to the Universe, we will share manifesting, tips, postcards, creativity, abundance, and prosperity. Here is your host, Melissa Caprio. Hey everybody and welcome to Postcards to the Universe with Melissa, creating the life you crave. How are you guys doing today? I hope you're doing well. I have a really, really special show today. I have the authors of Proof of Life After Life, Dr. Raymond Moody and Paul Perry as my guests and they're going to join me in just a minute. I've been fascinated with this subject of near-death experiences, and we're gonna learn today about shared death experiences. Um, I think my whole life, actually, since I was a kid, I've always been fascinated. So, yeah, I'm really excited. (coughs) Just a little bit about me. Um, uh, For you guys who are joining me for the first time, I just wanna give you a big warm welcome. I usually share a lot about me, um, but you can find out so much about me at Post cards to the universe.com. I have a book. I talk all about it every show, but today I want to jump in because I have two guests with me today and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about that, but you can always listen to the replays on my website, postcards to the universe.com. And also we always put the show up on the archives at Ohm Times Radio. So you can always listen to previous shows. So my book is titled Postcards to the Universe, Harness the Universe's Power and Manifest Your Dreams. And I talk all about manifesting in the book, and I share my photographs of of manifesting stories along with the person's, um, whatever they put down on their postcard, when it became the reality, we share their story along with the photos. And I do want to mention also that I'm doing two workshops. One is titled Manifesting Through Gratitude, A Visual Journey. It's five weeks, it's online, and I teach people how to create more abundance in their life. using gratitude and we're going to use our camera phones for that as a little tool which makes it extra fun and I also have one on January 6th it's called put your wishes to work and manifest the life you desire and we're going to be making a manifesting postcard together and that's really cool to do in the beginning of the year so like I said you can check that out on postcards to the universe.com I have all the information there all right so let me read you their bios and bring them out So I have Dr. Raymond Moody and Paul Perry. Raymond A. Moody, Jr., MD, PhD, is the leading authority of near-death experiences and the author of several books, including The Seminal Life After Life. The founder of the Life After Life Institute, Moody has lectured on the topic throughout the world and is a counselor in private practice. He has appeared on many programs, including Today and Turning Point. Paul Perry has co-written several New York Times bestsellers, including The Light Beyond and Evidence of the Afterlife. He is also a documentary filmmaker, and for his film and the book about Salvador Dali, he has been knighted in Portugal. Oh, that's interesting. A groundbreaking book this is that combines nearly 50 years of afterlife and near-death experience research to provide proof of the existence of the soul and life after death from psychiatrist and best-selling author of Life After Life. Dr. Raymond Moody and New York Times bestselling author Paul Perry, after spending nearly five decades studying near-death experiences, Moody finally has the answer to humanity's most pressing question, what happens when we die? And in this book, Proof of Life After Life, both authors reveal that consciousness survives after the death of the body, featuring in-depth case studies, the latest research, and eye-opening interviews with experts. Proof explores everything from common paranormal signs to shared death experiences and much more. And you can learn more about each of these authors if you go to lifeafterlife.com or paulperryproductions.com. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for being with me today. 
All right, thank well, you. Thank nice you introduction. So Appreciate it. Yeah, thank <laughs> okay. you. Thank you very much. So, so um, first of all, okay, so uh, Raven, you've been doing this since the 70s. Am I correct in that? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just each ask you each. You've been, you've been doing this work since the 70s? And what got you into um, wanting to explore near-death experiences? Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately, I was not exposed to religion when I was a kid, except very minimally. And so mm -hmm. I grew up with no idea of an afterlife. And uh, so I went to the University of Virginia at age 18 with intending to study astronomy, but mm -hmm. took a philosophy course and immediately got hooked. And the particular book was Plato's Republic, which is, oddly, about mm -hmm. a near-death experience. Uh, it culminates in a near-death experience of a warrior and not just having no idea that anybody took the notion of an afterlife seriously. I asked mm -hmm. my professor and he said that early Greek philosophers knew about cases of people who were believed dead and resuscitated. But, but I didn't, you know, I had no idea. It still applied, but in 1965, in Charlottesville, I met a man who had such an experience. He was a professor of psychiatry there, and that really got me hooked. And I, subsequent to that time, through my Ph.D. in philosophy and then three years of teaching philosophy at a university and then uh, going to medical school and ultimately going into forensic mm -hmm. psychiatry. But throughout that career, I've just I've interviewed thousands and thousands of people who came to the brink of death and had these astonishing mm -hmm. experiences. So that's how yeah. I got into it. It's yeah, it amazing. It's process, really interesting. Amazing. It I can imagine it is a long process and 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 Paul, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Mm -hmm. What made you sure. interested in exploring this? Well I I was editing a uh, uh, Amer American Health magazine in New York City. This was in nineteen eighty eight. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Raymond and I share the same agent, same book agent. Mm -hmm. And one day our agent, Nat Sobel, called me and he said, uh, would you like to write a book with Dr. Raymond Moody? And I said, I have no idea who Raymond Moody is. <laughs> and and he, said, he said, well, he, he's the man who named and defined the near-death experience. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and and he, he said, well, you know, for a guy who's the editor of a major health magazine, you really need to get educated on things like mm. near-death experience, which was an offhand insult, for, but it's an agent, so they <laughs> talk like that. And, uh, and so I said, sure, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll go meet Raymond. And Raymond was living in uh, Georgia at the time. And I flew down to meet him. And, uh, you know, Raymond is an amazing person from the first time you meet him. Mm. And so we started writing this book called The Light Beyond. And uh, I just got entranced by Raymond's account of near-death experiences and the stories we would hear. People would come by his house and tell their stories. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it just got amazing. So anyway, we, we wrapped up the book, The Light Beyond. And there was, a, in my estimation, a piece missing. And, and that was, there was nothing in the book about children and near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. And Raymond said, well, nobody's done much research on that yet, except for one guy, a pediatrician in Seattle, Melvin Morse. And uh, uh, he connected me with Melvin, and I did a book with, with him called Closer to the Light, and it's all, it's all about children and near-death experiences. And after that, I wrote that book, and then I thought, well, there's something missing here. There needs to be a larger study about, show, about people who have had near-death experiences and how they affect them during their life. So we wrote a book about that. And on and on, every book I would write, mm -hmm. I would find a gap that needed to be filled. And that's yeah. gone now through, I think, 15 books on near-death experiences. Wow. Well, um, so... so 
being this book, because I've read some both of your other books um, previously, mm -hmm. um, not knowing I was going to get to interview you one day, so that's pretty cool. But um, right. I had never heard of a shared death experience until I was introduced in this book. And I see now that I've heard of these experiences um, right. where there have been situations, and I didn't know that you termed it a shared death experience. I, I know people who have had experience, and I may have had one myself. Um, I, I'll tell you quickly, my best friend's mother was in hospice, and she was dying, and they were very close. Her father had died years ago, and I was in the room, in the hospice room, and I was laying at the foot of the bed on the cot that was brought in the room, and I had fallen asleep, and my friend was in bed with her mom, and it was at that time, like, it was happening at any moment, and uh, her husband was in the next room, and I felt this, all of a sudden, like, this overwhelming, like, I woke up, and I felt this overwhelming thing, and I said, I have to get out of here. I got to get out of here, and I don't know huh. what it was. It felt like, like, I just needed to leave, and then I was feeling guilty because I was leaving her, but I just felt like I couldn't be there. And an hour after I left, she called. We were, I went back to her house that her mother had passed, and I really believe that it was her mom who wanted me to leave because she wanted a personal, she wanted to be with her daughter alone, and I was there. So I, it, when I was reading your book, I was thinking, hmm, maybe that is, is kind of an example, because I was a witness to it, and I really believe it was her telling me, get out, because it was so strong, and I was in a, I had yeah. fallen asleep, you know? It was very, very interesting. Yeah. And it was a really interesting, and it stuck with me. This is many years ago, and it stuck with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, the, Melissa, what you're describing mm -hmm. there is, I'm sure lots of people listening to this will mm -hmm. know exactly what you're talking about, because this is very, very common, and mm -hmm. the one, one remarkable thing about it is that <clears throat> our society from the time of the ancient Greeks mm -hmm. has had a standard way to talk about these experiences. And uh, some people, like Plato, mm -hmm. look at this and they take it at face value and they say this indicates an afterlife. <clears throat> the other strain of thought, which goes back to the ancient Greek Democritus, who lived about the same time, and he studied these things and he said, oh, this is just the, the biological activity. The body appears dead, but there's no such mm -hmm. thing as a moment of death. And so this is the residual biological activity in the body that accounts for these things. Nowadays, we call it oxygen deprivation to the brain, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so the trouble, what creates the difficulty with these, these shared death experiences is that the bystanders have identically the same experience that the person who is dying have, including often saying they leave their body at the... Mm -hmm. They they leave their body as grandma dies and goes up mm -hmm. part way toward this light with grandma and uh, people say the room changes configuration it fills with light they see the relatives and friends of the dying person who's already passed away coming into the room and some people actually have um, concurrently with the dying person they they empathically co-live the dying life review of the person who's passing away. Right. And mm -hmm. and the trouble with these things, Melissa, from the point of view of the standard way of mm -hmm. thinking about it, is that the the bystanders are not ill or injured. There's no question of oxygen deprivation to their brains, but right. they have the same experience. And mm -hmm. you mentioned that you had not heard of this. Well, I, I think this has been out in the public domain for a long time, but... Um, I think the reason why it's remained hidden is that people are scared of this. You know, mm -hmm. it's, um, at least when it's the, the person with a near-death experience, we can kind of distance mm -hmm. ourselves from that. You know, it's like this mm -hmm. other person had a close call with death. But when it gets to it, people can more easily imagine that maybe when mm -hmm. their grandma dies, they could be there and, and have one of these. So it's it's very frightening to people, I think, and, and also that it 
it just shatters our common way of thinking about it. You know, we mm -hmm. if, 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 if it's not oxygen deprivation to the brain, then we're out of ways of, to, to argue about it, right? I mean, what do you right. think? So, that's where I am. I give up. I, I can't think my way out of this. And so, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, to me, to me, there, you know, this. To I say that, to my utter astonishment, still very counterintuitive to me. But I gather, yeah, there there is an afterlife. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I would think after so many years of the stories that you both have heard that you do believe in an afterlife, and you're giving us in your. I mean. Y you know, you're giving us as much proof as you can gather, right? Because right. physically, yeah. we can't we can't really measure it yet in scientific terms, right? With mathematics or whatever, yet. Maybe one day we will be able to. But as much as people's experiences. So um, with you, Paul, have you, mm -hmm. has there been, I mean, because in your book, both of you talk about some personal experiences that you've actually had. So, Paul, do you have any that you want to share, any like some amazing observations or that you've discovered in your research over the past so many years working on this? Sure. Yeah. Uh, several years ago, I can't remember the exact year, it's shame on me, when my mother was dying. My mother was dying of Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. and uh, the morning she died, which I hadn't known she died yet, I got a phone call from Vernon Neppe, who uh, Vernon and I had worked on a book project at one time. He the, was the head of neuropharmacology at University of Washington Medical School, and I hadn't spoken to him in five years. And he called me and he said, you know, I was sitting here, it was a Sunday morning, he said, I was sitting here reading the newspaper and a voice told me, call Paul Perry. And I ignored the voice and I kept reading and about an hour later, uh, this voice said, call Paul Perry. So I'm calling you and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. And what's he said, what's going on in your life? And I said, well, my mother's dying right right now and uh she has alzheimer's and and that was you know that's his specialty mm -hmm. and so he said he said that's my specialty i know we've started using a number of experimental medications and treatments and he told me about some of them and in the course of this this conversation the my phone was beeping with another call coming in and so i said i've got to answer this call i'll call you back later and uh, it was the uh, the rest home where my mother was. And they said, She's, your mother's just died. Mm -hmm. And so when I spoke later to Vernon Nappy, he felt that that was some kind of an odd communication between him and my mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that would be defined in this book as a shared death experience. Right. Right. That, Raymond, yeah. Yeah. Raymond's also had one. And, yeah, I'd well, love to hear it, Raymond. Um, you know, in 1993, I was working with a group of people um, to set up a big study of this. And uh, I was out west, and um, it was on a Mother's Day. We finished the conference, and I called my mom just to check on her. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, but yesterday I developed a rash. My brothers and sisters took her to the ER. The doctor said, I don't think this is anything, but like, just he gave her an appointment to see another doctor on Monday, the next day after I was talking to her. So when she went to the doctor, he said, you have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and you have two days, oh, wow. two years, two weeks to live. And oh, so, my God. Um, so yeah. two weeks later to the day she did die, but... Um, wow. While it was going on, my my me and my wife and my sister, who saw my father, who was there, you know, mm -hmm. who had died eighteen months before, and um, my brother-in-law, we all had this sort of empathic co-living of her experience. So wow. that sort of um, that sort of put my curiosity about it in a different direction. So we. Backed away from that for a while, so I could study my 
or sort of process my experience. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it's and I, I continue to be curious, as as I mentioned earlier, Melissa, as to why mm-hmm. um, why people are resistant to this. See, it's um, the near death experience. People are all have all come to um, to accept, but I think this mm-hmm. other, even more important phenomenon, I think, of the mm-hmm. shared death experience. It's people have a harder time with this because it's harder to distance yeah. from it. And um, mm-hmm. also because what do you say? I mean, you can't say that it's the oxygen right. deprivation to the brain because the people are not sick. So right. what is it? And uh, I th- Fear, right? Don't you think it's fear and then religious dogma? Yeah. A lot of the religious it dogma is, is like, it's like, well, you, you can't, go. you can't have your own experience. You have to go through me because I'm the one that has the experience it's with bad. God, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's fear. Religious ideology. Yeah. Yeah. It's fear. It's definitely People are fear. scared. Mm-hmm. Definitely fear and religious ideology. But it's also, when it happens, it's like the, impossibility that something like this can happen. Right. Mm-hmm. That yeah. all of a sudden you've kind of, you've kind of tripped into somebody else's uh, perhaps most intimate moment. And, uh, and it's, it's just a very strange feeling. I mean, for, the, for years with this, with this particular subject, mm-hmm. in, all the, in all the books we had ever written, we always had a couple of shared death experiences in the books. Yeah. But we didn't didn't, for some reason, give them too much attention. And, and you read them all down through history, mm-hmm. the shared death experiences, all the way back to Plato. And uh, uh, but having, having our own and then talking about the shared death experiences we had written about was, was a totally different experience. We realized at that point that these, that these are objective experiences, that right. if more than one person is able to witness something like this, then it, it objectively happens. A near-death experience is subjective. You know, only right. really one person has it, and then only they can describe it. But a shared death experience takes that an enormous step further. And that step is that it shows that the possibility that consciousness has left the body at the point of death. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah, what, and you... Go ahead, finish your thought. And then so I was going to say, and that's what everybody in this field is trying to prove. They're mm-hmm. trying to identify what consciousness is, but also they're, in honesty, trying to see if it survives bodily death. And, and that's, we think that that is the case with the shared death experience. Yeah. Yeah, because you have other people are witnessing something, as you call supernatural. Something has gone has happened that other people are witnessing, and the person who's having the near death experience, um, or who is or transitioning, I should say, and is having because you talk about the seven reasons to believe in the afterlife, and I will get into those. I don't want to start that until we come back from the break because I don't want to cut you cut you off, but um, uh, that some people will have these uh, moments of clarity and you'll talk about that these moments of clarity where there's no way scientifically that they could have these because of whatever it is that they're dying of uh, maybe right. you know there's parts of their brain there's no way that that could be happening right <laughs> like it's just impossible no. and then other people are a witness to it so that would be considered a shared death experience because they're witnessing that miraculous um, insight Correct. Would that be? Yeah, that's also that's, considered one. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, what is there a story? Um, and I, this is for either of you that really has stuck with you of all of the people that you've interviewed that you said, "Oh, I just need to explore this even further." I mean, I know there's many, but obviously maybe just one you can mention. Well, there are many, but you know, one that comes yeah. to my mind is an elderly woman. I, I was a professor of psychology at West Georgia University, and, and uh, in about 1990, um, this elderly woman came to one of my classes and told me about an experience she had had with her husband. They had 
it was one of these couples who literally were childhood friends and grew up in the same little town and 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 uh, never had kids but um uh she said that as he was dying she mm -hmm. empathically experienced his life review that it was oh. this um review came up of, around her of everything he had ever done and they were talking about it they could both see it and they they had a conversational exchange as it was going on and um, and you know that sounds so extraordinary and uh, and yet i've you know quite a number of cases i've had over the years where people uh, say this that they they were they co-lived the life review and maybe i should say to folks that um in a near-death experience one very common element of it is that people say time stands still and they see everything mm -hmm. they've ever done in a sort of panorama and they they witness it from the point of view not just that they had when they did each action but rather from the impact it had on those with whom they were interacting and uh, so for years I thought, well, this has to be somebody who was intimately familiar with the person, right? It had to be a mm -hmm. close relative or something. But no, no, like some years ago, uh, my wife and I got a communication from a ER doctor who was called to the emergency room to resuscitate a patient he had never met. But as mm -hmm. this guy was dying, he said the, the guy's um, life review just sprang up wow. right around it. He was able to and so, you know, this is this is something that this does not fit into consensual reality as you right. and I appreciate it. Right. This is this, and yet it's a very regular thing. So yeah. what I finally come to is that, you know, I like I give up. This is apparently <laughs> Yeah, I I've, 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 I've spent my whole life I spent my whole life trying to think my way out of things because right. you know that's what if you try to support what you already think that's I can't see how that's fun. What you got to do is you got to bear down and think of every possible objection. Right. So where I've come in this is that I just give up. I don't know what else to say, but except to my utter astonishment, there is an afterlife. I love that. Yeah. And you know what? I love I love the fact that, that we have a life review. I think that's awesome. I oh, really do. Great. I yeah. think it's amazing, right? It answers so many questions. It is. But Paul, I want to hear yeah. your story when we come back. So let's take our break here and then we'll continue sure. the conversation. Stay tuned everybody. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. Okay. Everyone has a story. I have a story. You have a story. We all have a story. As I see it, you have three choices. Allow your story to define you, use it to excuse you, or utilize it as a method to empower you. It's your life. You have the power. You choose. Rewrite your story on finduniquelyyou.com. Hi. I'm Melissa Caprio from Postcards to the Universe, creating the life you crave. Do you believe in magic? What if I told you all you had to do was get a little creative and work a dream spell to bring anything you can imagine into your life? Well, guess what? I've got the spell for you. Postcards to the Universe, a global movement for manifestation, is a casting magical tool for you to use whenever you want. How does living in passion sound to you? Join me in my movement where you get to create in the magical playground. Let's think outside the box and do some playful conjuring. By casting out our desires with a manifesting postcard, we explore our hearts and allow the alchemy of our dreams to appear. And don't forget to tune in each week here on Ohm Times Radio with my show, Postcards to the Universe, Creating the Life You Crave at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. I share tips on creativity, abundance, and prosperity, and you will be introduced to the coolest guests, trailblazers, mystics, and creatives who enrich our lives.
Welcome back. And if you're just joining me, I have proof of life after life authors, Raymond Moody and Paul Perry as my guests. And we're talking about what happens when we die, NDEs, near-death experiences, and shared death experiences. So, um, Paul, do you want to share a story that really stuck with you um, that has made you want to continue? I mean, this is such interesting work. I mean, you guys really must yeah, it's be so like... Interesting. You can't stop. <laughs> You I mean, can't I, stop. I started, <laughs> I started out planning to write one book with Raymond. Now we've written <laughs> six books together, and I've written all these other books with other people, and I made two it. movies. So, yeah, I, I love don't know. that. So, what do you have? One that kind of uh, stuck with you? I do. I know because yeah, there's so I many, do. and I don't want to take away because for everybody that has <laughs> this experience, it's got to be amazing to them, right? And that's their story oh, yeah. special. But yeah, one yeah, that's just yeah. kind of stuck with you. Well, a, a Hollywood producer that I can't name. Okay. Was on the was on the East Coast visiting her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And his, her boyfriend had never met her family. He was uh, in Massachusetts, and she was in Los Angeles. But early in the morning, one time in Boston, uh, she began to feel uneasy and kind of found it impossible to get back to sleep. Mm -hmm. And as the feeling intensified for her, she, she began to think about members of her family. And then she started to think about her father, and then for... No particular reason, because he had been healthy when she left. She began to think that maybe he was in some kind of a, a health distress and needed some kind of a help. So she began to toss and turn as she did. It. Her, her boyfriend woke up and said he was having trouble sleeping as well. They began to talk about this. It was early in the morning. And as they did, they suddenly saw her father hovering over the bed. Oh, wow. Uh, as she said, like a ghost. And they both saw the father, although her boyfriend had, had never met her family. Wow. And they both just froze looking at the father for several moments. Then she got a call later that, uh, not much later, that her father had died. Hmm. And her response, her quote to me was, it was strange but not creepy. I looked at him for signs of distress or some other reason that he was there, but I just couldn't figure it out. Then it dawned on me that he was, had certainly died and wanted to tell me himself. And she said she had always had a strong bond with him, but this felt perfectly natural to her. And that was one mm -hmm. that stuck with her. We have other ones in the book that are like that, though. Yeah, you do. Yeah, I mean, the book is, yeah, I love the book because you give many stories um, from people who have shared with you their own experiences, and they vary greatly, which is what I really, I thought was really interesting. I love that. But I want to um, talk a little bit about, you, you cover it in a seven reasons to believe in the afterlife. And I mean, for time constraints, we probably couldn't go over all seven, but maybe you, either one wants to mention um, a couple of those that you offer us to believe that there is proof of an afterlife. To well, whoever I wants to take it. Yes. Okay, go ahead, Raymond. Um, you know, I, one thing I do is uh, grief counseling, and I still mm -hmm. do it. Uh, and I, I've actually done that even before I was a medical doctor, because People would come to me who knew mm -hmm. I was investigating near-death experiences to, for that in mind. But, um, you know, one thing I hear from people constantly is, if I only had five more minutes, you know, after mm -hmm. somebody dies, people mm -hmm. have this great longing just to be able to talk to them again just for a brief time. And to me, I think one of the wildest, most unbelievable facts that I know Melissa mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that it is actually quite easy <laughs> yeah. to create an environment in which you can go through a process during which you will seem to see and converse with um, the uh, an apparently dead person, and mm -hmm. and not only that, but that this this fact is the very is one of the foundations of the whole way we think in the West. Mm -hmm. which came from, ultimately, the ancient Greek philosophers. And what the average person in ancient Greece would think that a philosopher was, 
mm-hmm. was the person who called up the spirits of the deceased. And for years that was thought, oh, you know, that's just a legend or something. But no, they had these very well-documented historical institutions called oracles of the dead, which they had various procedures where they mm-hmm. would bring about this experience. And one of the most common ones, which is um, is simply uh, in a darkened room, Mm-hmm. After reflecting and meditating on your deceased relative and so on, you you gaze into a mirror by candlelight or a dim light in a dark room. And mm-hmm. under those circumstances, it's a very common thing that um, people will have an experience during which they take to be an mm-hmm. actual contact. It's not regarded as a fantasy or they, they are in the full state of waking awareness. Mm-hmm. They say that the... The apparition of the deceased appears in the mirror. A lot of people mm-hmm. say that the apparition then steps out of the mirror, comes into mm-hmm. the room fully three-dimensional. Or other people say that their experience is that their consciousness goes through the mirror yeah. and they come out on the other side into this other realm where, where that's where the uh, engagement with their loved ones occurs. About 30% of the people who go through this Report mm-hmm. hearing an audible voice. They actually yeah. hear the person. Almost mm-hmm. all the rest of them say it's a heart to heart or mind to mind communion with the person. And not only, uh, what reason we don't know about this is I suspect you can gather it that this was in early Christianity up to about the 300s, but then they realized that, uh uh-oh, people may be finding out their own things here, so we better clamp down on this. (laughs) Right. It was was, um, outlawed, but Mm. nonetheless, it keeps cropping up. um, Yeah. Everybody knows the character of John, uh, of, um, everybody knows the character of, um, who was the, 007, the James Bond. 007, James Bond. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, John D. Well, but... Yeah, but not many people know that he was an actual character, that Fleming based him on a character named mm. John D. Um, oh, I did 15, not know that. 20, 1527 to 1608, and who found out about this himself and who did it. And, um, and, that, uh, and this was very well known even to our great-great-grandparents. It mm-hmm. was... Until the radio age, this was something that people did. It was very well known in England and Britain and America that you could do this. But with the advent of radio, where people stopped interacting, but rather just sort of listening to the radio and then the TV, this dropped out. But the amazing thing is, and I'm I'm saying this based on the fact that not just of my work, Mm -hmm. but of multiple different investigators have... um, have yeah. tested this and they get the same results. So, you know, yeah. you really there is part of our common collective um, cultural heritage of humankind is this very easy procedure actually for calling up the spirits of your yeah. deceased relatives. Well, you, you you call it the psychomantium? Is that it? Psychomantium? Am I pronouncing that it right? Yeah. Yeah. That was the yeah. Greek word for it, yeah. Right, and that you had one, Raymond, you had one in your home, and you were doing them so much you got burnt out because everybody's knocking on your door. But I had heard about this with the Greeks, and I wanted to talk about this, and I heard about this, but I never really fully, you know, I heard about it many years ago and never really investigated it. But it's really interesting now because um, a year and a half ago, I lost my sister, Mm. and she was special needs. And my mom is I've had a couple of visitation dreams. Like, I know there were visitations. At the moment she died, a cardinal showed up at the window, and my mom said, oh, she passed. So that could have been a shared death experience. But this would be great, and I love that you teach us how to build one because I'm going to show my mom how to do it so she can see my sister. You know, because I think that it's, it's, it's so much easier than you would think. That to do it, the way you describe it. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, People just can't believe this, even though it's it's been known since remote antiquity all over the world. And um, so, you know, it's 
why why do we block it? Well, one thing that occurs to me is that maybe um, you know it's a lot of effort. We have to expend a lot of effort to maintain the illusion that things are mm-hmm. as they seem. You right. Know, it's, uh, to get along in yeah. the practical world, we we have to not think of this so much, right? So, yeah. But but we, you know, it is something that is there, and it's part of being a human being. What I've seen since um, 1975, when my book was published, is that uh, due to the advent of cardiopulmonary resuscitation, making you know, mm-hmm. these near-death experiences available. They were always around, but in the 60s and 70s, when the CPR got perfected, then mm-hmm. all of a sudden an experience that was what always existed, but which was very rare, mm-hmm. suddenly became very common. So what I mm-hmm. think is happening in our society, um, Melissa, is that mm-hmm. the afterlife is becoming infused with this life in yeah. the sense that Everybody you know knows somebody who has mm-hmm. been to the other side. And yeah. I think when that occurs, there, there's a, I think society has got to come pretty quickly to some sort of peace with this notion of an afterlife because it's, it's gotten to where yeah. it's um, everybody knows somebody who's been yeah. there. And with the internet now and YouTube, you can watch a million videos. I wanted to um, talk about what, um, maybe Paul, you can share what what terminal lucidity is. Because this is, I I mean, I've I've heard of it before, but uh, you really describe it well in the book. Both of you really describe it. It's very easy to understand. But for those who don't know what it is, if you could share with us. Well, terminal lucidity is, is defined as a flash of life. It mm-hmm. takes place shortly before one's death. Okay. So it, it can be quite dramatic because it takes place in people who are essentially dead. I mean, there's a lot of people who have no brain waves when they have terminal experiences. Mm-hmm. Or they're in, in end-stage Alzheimer's and they're kind of mm-hmm. gone. Uh, I've seen one, and then there's another one that really stands out in, in history. But uh, I had a son who broke his leg. And he was in the hospital, and I would go in every day and sit with him. And one day they brought in a, a gentleman who was at end stage Alzheimer's. So they would, mm-hmm. you know, just laid in bed all day, and he didn't move much or attempt to communicate. And one day his family came in, they would come in every day as well. And one day they were all there, and he suddenly popped out of it. He became perfectly lucid. He made sense, and he talked about their lives together and how he felt about each of the individual people who were there. Stood up on his bed and, and kind of dominated the room with a nice, lucid, coherent conversation. Mm. And his family was shocked because they'd seen him for the, a week or so just going out the door. And so they started to say, I'm, you know, we're going to be able to take Dad home now. He's okay. And... Mm. Uh, then they came back the next day and he was dead. He had died. Wow. And that's typical of terminal lucidity, is that yeah. it's, it's generally an end stage uh, uh, presentation that as a person starts to die, they, they then, some people will then pop out of it and become very lucid. Another example of that is a woman named uh, Katrina Emmer who lived in a mental institution in Germany. Mm-hmm. This was in the, the 30s. And she had had meningitis in, in her childhood, and she never had never spoken her entire life. Fouled herself, couldn't speak, would kind of, as they put it, would make animal sounds to speak. And as she began to die, uh, she started to, with great lucidity, sing a song to herself. Mm. And, and the song, the line she repeated was, where does the soul find its home, its peace? And the people in this institution all knew who she was. They'd taken care of her for years. So they all came in and gathered around her. And she continued to, to sing and to act very normal. And uh, uh, doctors wrote about it. 
one of the doctors presented the story of Catherine Emmer to the National Socialist Party in Germany, mm. the party that was previous to the Nazi Party, right. as as an ad, as an advocation for not euthanizing people with mental deficit. Wow! And uh, uh, but it was a very powerful story, and that's typical of of what happens with terminal lucidity. Yeah, it was. It's interesting, and that's considered yeah. one of the seven reasons of because there's so many cases of this, right? That's one of the reasons. There's a lot of, of cases. Proof. Of people are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and and when you see this in the hospital, which happens uh-huh. all the time, it, sure, you know, people in hospice or who deal with mm-hmm. the terminal ill, all of them will have experiences like this. And, yeah, um, a man flew from Australia back 20-something years ago to see me mm-hmm. to tell about this uh, experience he had with his wife. who She had been terminally ill, just going downhill. And then one day she just rallied. And, uh, and you know, he thought she was going to be fine, but then she quickly died. And when he was trying to describe to me, I, look, I wish I could convey the look on his face when he said, okay. that he said, I felt that she already had one foot on the other side. Yeah. And that's definitely how it feels it's like yeah. when you don't deal with the terminally ill for a long period of time you eventually get feeling like you're just like you're sort of halfway yeah. there already when it's yeah the scene of a, that's yeah. how i felt with my friend's mom that she was halfway on the other side and she i feel like i described like yeah. she kicked me in the ass to get the hell out of there because she wanted to be with her daughter <laughs> alone <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like, get out of here. But you talk about, yeah. which I thought was really cool, people who have witnessed you say mists and they hear music. And some yeah. people have actually seen with their own eyes the looks like the soul leaving the body. It's just fascinating to me that how many stories that people yeah. have been a witness to that. Well, you know, this one is thing that you hear from doctors, yeah, yeah I mean, I, you right. know, it's like, as the patient was dying, I saw this mist mm-hmm. or cloud come out, and you know, one guy told me it disappeared through the ceiling, or, you know, people say that it's, and yeah. what is it? Well, I give up, I give up, but it's, um, yeah. you know, um, it occurs. I, I mean, mm-hmm. I've seen it myself. I, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know Wow. what to and say. The, 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 and the, the, myst, the mystical light has been reported for mm-hmm. hundreds of years. But we found yeah. some really great. We found some really great case studies from a large 19th century uh, study uh, that involved. They involved all of these actually, light, mist, and music. And mm-hmm. in some cases, in some cases, people who were standing around the deathbed would uh, would hear music, like a beautiful music. They didn't have mm-hmm. radios, then. and and it was a beautiful music, and they couldn't find it. And then other wow. people who were there didn't hear it. And sometimes the music would last, in a couple of cases, more than one day. But they would hear wow. this music that just seemed to come out of the air, but they couldn't find yeah. its origin. Uh, yeah. And, you, and back you know, to the, this, yeah, again, this goes back literally to the foundation of Western civilization. Right. The Christians based right. their uh, theory of the afterlife on... Plato's book, The Phaedo, which is, mm-hmm. they, it's a long story, but the Christians, you know, that's mm-hmm. where their theology of the afterlife came from. And that's about this very topic. It's about the relationship of music mm-hmm. to the afterlife. And uh, it's a, a, you know, not as common as near-death experiences, but mm-hmm. you find plenty of cases of people who say that grandma never had any interest in poetry or music, or whatever, mm-hmm. but... Just before she died, she started singing or reciting poetry or sometimes yeah. making up poetry on the spot. Yeah, and, it's interesting. Uh, is- that is interesting because I noticed two things that caught my eye. One, that many people who have had a witness to it when there's a group are the atheists where the believers don't, which I thought, hmm, that's interesting. (laughs) And then the second thing is, is a lot of the NDs, when they come back, and I am, obviously, of course, it changes you, come back with these abilities, and they're always in the artistic realm. And I just thought, hmm, that's really interesting, too. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. You know, creativity. Artists. 
Creativity, yeah. what is that word? Well, you mm -hmm. know, if you trace the origins of it back to the Greeks, um, creativity was what we would think of as a paranormal experience. It consisted mm -hmm. of these entities, the muses, and so that mm -hmm. the people would, to, to have the poetic inspiration, they would go to these places called the museons, and you would consort with your spirit. Muse. Right. And, uh, oh. you know, that sounds antique until you start talking to artists. Right. They say, yeah, you know, it's like, I. this doesn't come from me, they say. Yeah. They point up and, they, yeah, I just open myself to it. And it, so creativity mm -hmm. is, you know, it's... Interesting. Why don't we call that a paranormal experience? So to me, no. it's not so surprising that people who come back from a near-death experience sometimes yeah. are, are seized with a musical ability or a art. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The most amazing one I know from recent years, Melissa, is uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Chikoria, who's a mm -hmm. Ph.D. in physiology and M.D. and was the, a very eminent uh, professor of neurosurgery, uh, I'm sorry, of orthopedic surgery who um, was struck in the neck by lightning and, and had mm -hmm. a near-death experience. But afterward, although he had never had any interest in music, he s developed a strange fascination with the piano and started dr having mm -hmm. this recurrent <laughs> dream in which he was playing the same piece on the piano on a concert stage. Yeah. To make a long story short, he learned how to transcribe music and learn the piano, and now in addition to being an eminent um, orthopedic surgeon, he's also a concert pianist. And, you know, it, that, that series right. of events doesn't make sense within right. consensual reality <laughs> as we have it. Right. It doesn't. It's not. No, it doesn't. I love these what, stories, what, though. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah. What were you going to say? One thing that's kind of funny is if, if you go to a near-death experience conference, which there are many, mm. uh, Undoubtedly, somebody shows up with five or six or ten paintings that they've made wow. as a result of having the experience. And you see tunnel experiences and different types of light and on and on. Right, Raymond? You, oh, you yeah. See a lot yeah. Of I mean, I just, uh, I just, I've heard this repeatedly. It's, uh, oh, decades ago I met in, in Toronto this elderly woman who, came to one of my lectures and brought her paintings, but she said she had never, she was an award-winning artist in Toronto, and she uh, had never had any interest in painting until her near-death experience, and then yeah. she, you know, it, so that is, I mean, it's just something really extraordinary that, um, mm hmm I mean, it makes sense to me yeah. as a creative person. I'm an artist, a photographer. Mm -hmm. I feel like everything in writer, everything's downloaded. I can't explain it. Absolutely. It just, right. it Absolutely. just I just yeah. feel like it's just down. I just get these downloads, and yeah. So it makes that's sense what, to me. You know, artists, <laughs> artists say that. You mm -hmm. know, it's, that's what artists say. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it's amazing. So mirror gazing to access it. You know, yeah, I'm going to try that now. <laughs> yeah, definitely now, try that. I, now that I see and how yeah. easy it is to make yeah. one, to create the space, yeah. I'm definitely going to try that, yeah. Well, can we go back to the Psychomantium for a minute? Sure, I, I please. Bring something yeah. up. Mm -hmm. when, when you first read about these and, and hear people talk about them, they sound like subjective experiences. Mm -hmm. Or they sound like, in a way, they sound like waking dreams. But Raymond had uh, a patient who came from Argentina, and uh, she came to see her, her daughter who had uh, died of cancer. And mm -hmm. she, she showed up at his psychomantium. He was really pushy. She just wanted to go right in without any preparation and try to see her daughter. Uh, and with that attitude, she went in and saw nothing. Mm -hmm. But... But later in the day, and it was about 3.30 in the afternoon, she had come with her sister, and they were sitting in the room talking about the experience that, that she did not have. And all of a sudden, these orbs came into the room. Yeah. And to me, this makes this an objective experience, because the, right. her sister photographed the orbs. And what you can see is these orbs 
moving around the world. And it. there's one there's one that stopped in front of her and she said that her daughter was in there and she spoke to the orb for a period of time. Is that right, Raymond? Oh my God, wow. I love that. That story's in the book. I don't mean yeah. to cut you guys off, but we're out of time. Out I could talk time. to you oh, forever. No. Thank you so much, Raymond thank Moody you. and Paul Perry. And guys, you. look them up, get thank their you. book. <laughs> thank you. God, that Thanks was a such lot. a pleasure. Thank you everyone for listening to Postcards to the Universe with Melissa, creating life you crave, and I'm wishing everyone a wonderful week filled with joy, abundance, and love. Peace. See you next week. Peace to you.